Good morning, church. Okay, so just a little inside baseball. Is that what they call it? You know, inside baseball, behind the scenes. We're starting here, and I was giving the girls a hard time, because if you look at their shoes, you see that they match today? They match shoes. And I said, oh, that's so cute. You girls match. That's so cute. That's funny. And then I was like, you know what? I came over to the guys, and I said, gentlemen, you need to start matching shoes over here. The girls are bringing some good shoe game. And John goes, I only have three pairs, brown, black, and tennis shoes. I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> I, uh, Sydney's like, I wish I could do that, right? I have a lot of shoes. What's, like, I'll, I think I have more shoes than my wife does. <laughs> Is that bad? I don't think that's bad. Uh, we are so glad you're here. My name's Stephen. If we haven't met yet, we should do that in just a bit. But for now, we're going to start by praising our God in song. I invite you to stand as you're able. We've got some calisthenics going this morning. We love this one to start the year. This is Yes, Lord. Let's go. Gracious God, we thank you for that simple message this morning. God, for a song that can lift our hearts as we lift our hands and we lift our voices. God, we pray that in 2020, this new year that you set before us, we pray that we might say yes to you. God, allow us in this house this morning to keep distractions outside these walls and allow us to truly come together to hear your word sung, to hear your word spoken, God. Allow the message to resonate with us, not only today, but throughout the week and through all of 2020 that you give to us a living water, God, that we can say yes to you, and you provide for us in so many ways. Together, all of your children say together in one voice, amen. We are so glad that you are here this morning, and I know you are ready to greet those around you in Christ's name. So I'm going to invite you to do that for just a moment. Would you give a handshake, a high five, or a hug? Tell the folks around you good morning. Let's go. I need the music, Lily. Let's go. That was good, boys. About your grace from 
Good morning, church. Let's find those seats. We need like a a five second warning or something as it counts down. Yeah, dim the lights. We could just get Howard to watch. <laughs> it is great to see you all here this morning. My name's Stephen. If I haven't mentioned that yet, I'd love to meet you. We are just glad that you were here and happy 2020 to everybody. It feels a little weird that the new year, I think I like the way it felt, you know, midweek this week. It was like Thursday or Friday. It's like, what day of the week is this, you know? It is, yeah, it is great to have you all here. You'll notice one person's absent today. A couple people are absent today. You'll notice that Pastor Monty and Gloria are gone again. Father. Now, Pastor Monty had this scheduled because he had a conference he was presenting at or going to and all kinds of stuff, but they are not at the conference. He had to find people to take his place because uh, his dad is still struggling with health issues. So forgive me if I speak out of place, but they were going to Texas to be snowbirds, and he got sick, and now he's in the hospital. Okay, so... Gloria and Monty are in Texas to be with Monty's dad, even though they're from Nebraska, they were there to be snowbirds. You with me? So please pray for them. Pray for Pastor Monty and Gloria and obviously his dad. Remind me of his first name, your grandpa's first name? Kenny. I should have known that. It's like their family name. It's Kenny. You would have been a, you would have been a good Kenny too, Shelly. I'm going to call you that. Um, so we, K2, that's right. Uh, we are so glad you are here. And oh, I meant to tell you this earlier. We we took that offering on Christmas Eve, and I promised I would give you the amount today. $2,191.75 were raised. You can clap your hands for that on Christmas Eve. That was from our, our four worship services that we have, and all of those monies go into a, a fund for urgent needs. So if someone comes to the church and they have an urgent need, we can step up to the plate and help them with that. When Timber Creek comes to us like they did in, in November and says, we are short these supplies that we need for kids, we can provide that because of what you did. So, or the CAN program. So thank you for that. We are so appreciative that you stepped up in such a big way. And speaking of offerings, out on the table, if you can do me a favor today, if you gave money to the church through the envelopes, through the envelopes, like for example, my family doesn't have envelopes because we give online. That's just all of it's moved to that. But if you gave through the envelopes, um, they're on the table. So if you just grab those envelopes for 2020 or on the table, find your name. They're in alphabetical order. It'd be awesome to have all of those gone today so we can get rid of the table. I'm looking around. A lot of the names are the people that I'm looking at right now. Their names out on the table because I looked at them and saw them. So pick those up on your way out this morning. We would appreciate it. And then youth, back up and running. They've had a few weeks off. What time do you guys meet tonight? What, six o'clock? Six. It's on the screen. Okay. I should have asked the younger kids. They know. So from 6 to 7.30, we have a wonderful new team of six people that are going to be stepping up to the plate uh, to be a part of that. And actually, I, can I get those six folks to come up here real fast? You didn't know I was going to do this because I didn't know I was going to do this. But can I get those, can I get the Thomas I, the Armors, and the Bartos? <laughs> I think that's the plural of Thomas, isn't it? Thomas I? Come on up. Mason and I came up with that this morning. <laughs> so... These wonderful folks are going to be stepping up and into leadership roles uh, in our youth ministry here at St. Paul's. And I just wanted to pause for a second. Can we have a word of prayer for them as they step into that new role? Would that be okay? So let's, let's bow our heads. Gracious God, we thank you so much for the youth of this church, for the fact that you've created a church that can reach out into this community. And we pray that you might be about these wonderful people standing up here before you, ready to do your work. Be with Chris and Stephanie and Brett and Kelly and, and Kara and Rich as they step up into this leadership role. Give them the energy it takes to work with young people. Give them the ideas to stir within the kids a new sense of hope in the Bible, a new sense of belonging in a wonderful, tight-knit group that you're going to help them create. We are so thankful for their time, for their talents, and all that they're going to bring to this ministry as they call out, they call out to you to live out their purpose in this church. Together, all your children say, amen. Thank you guys very much, yeah? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, well, that's all the announcements I've got. We're going to keep worshiping God here this morning and focus in on God. We're going to praise him with a couple more songs and invite you to sing along with us as we lift our voices in his house this morning. you've done no matter the hurt that you carry or the 
race that you've run when you spent time chasing worthless treasure discovered you can't buy forever never thought you'd feel so alone it's time to come home it's time to come home it's time to embrace the love of the father it's time to come home it's time to come home time to live a new life changed by grace and zero it's time to come home. You felt a broken heart. You lost sight of your dreams. You feel a burden so heavy. You're torn apart at the seams. When the world is crumbling all around you, you lost so much and now you found you just can't face this life on your own. It's time to come home. It's time to come home. It's time to embrace the love of the Father. It's time to come home. It's time to come home, time to live a new life, changed by grace and erased. It's time to come home. You are home. There's an anchor for my soul, I can say it is well, Jesus has overcome, and the grave is over. Victory is won. He is risen from the dead, and I will rise when He calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will. Before my God, fall on my knees and rise. I will rise. There's a day that's strong.
drawing near when darkness breaks to light and the shadows disappear and my faith shall be my eyes Jesus has overcome and the grave is overwhelmed victory is won he's risen from the dead and I will rise when he calls my name. No more sorrow, no more pain. I will rise on eagle's wings before my God. Fall on my knees and rise. stand and sing. I hear the voice of many angels sing. Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the cry of every longing heart. Worthy is the Lamb. And I hear the voice of people said amen church you sound great let's keep this up in 2020 what do you say all right it's time for the kids i think so the rest of y'all can sit kids you got room to get out now here we go come on up Happy 
Happy New Year. Oh my goodness. Try that again. Can you believe it? Your children aren't loud enough. What are you doing? They're being quiet. All right, church, help us out here. Okay. Happy New Year. That was so much better. Good job. <laughs> All right, guys, can you do me a favor? I need some help today. I'd like to say a New Year's prayer, but I don't know what to say. Can you give me three things that we should hope for this new year? What's something good to hope for? What do you think? What do you think? Say one more time. God, for God to do what? Or just be? God to help us. Okay, what else? Anybody else got an idea? What else is good to hope for? Nobody's got anything? This is the quietest you have ever been. Are you tired? Did your parents let you stay up till midnight? I heard one, yeah, somebody's in trouble. <laughs> okay, so how about this? How about water and bread? We always need something to eat and something to drink, right? I know, because your noses are in the cabinet, and you always tell your parents there's nothing in here, even though it's full of food. Am I right? Okay. So God to help us, some to eat and drink. What else? How about all of your friends at school? You're going to go back and see them. Are you excited to see them? Seriously, the quietest you've ever been. Okay. Will you guys pray with me? Church, will you help us out? Because apparently they have some aversion to talking today. Ready? All right. Dear God, help us. Feed us. Water us. Care for our friends. In this new year. Amen. All right. Would you guys like to go out for children's church? That they're excited about. <laughs> in this world again. It's all part of the Father's master plan. I asked this question at the first two services, and I knew what the answer was going to be. Has Have any of you noticed the United Methodist Church has been in the news this weekend? Some of you are laughing, so I assume that means yes. Um, sometimes the way things get painted is a little different. So what they are putting in the news is a proposal. And they're calling the proposal Protocol of Reconciliation and Grace Through Separation. Um, sounds really nice, but I do want to let you know it is just a proposal. The news is putting it forth as if this is the plan and this is what will happen. And really nothing has happened until General Conference. It's not the only proposal. Because there is, in fact, more than one that will go to General Conference. And I wanted you guys to know that, and I also wanted you to know that, that we're aware of it. The church is talking about it. Our senior pastor's not even here this week, but he'll talk about it. He'll talk about it with leadership. He'll talk about it with all of you and things like that. So nothing is going to happen before it actually happens. Does that make sense? I hope so. I just wanted to speak into that for a minute because I was afraid. We were thinking, well, what does this mean for us? And it just means that it's in the news. That's what it means right this second, okay? Sometimes our expectations don't meet up with reality. This was the first Christmas that I spent a Christmas morning without my three kiddos, which after a 10-hour workday really wasn't that bad. I got to sleep till 9.30. I knew they were happy at Dad's waking up on Christmas morning. I was good. And we had all these plans for our little blended family to have Christmas on Christmas night, okay? Open all the presents and not even have to wake up early the second day. So exciting. Excited. And um, I had already gathered my three to the house, and then Jared's ex was going to bring his three to the house, and we were pumped. And then we get a call probably like five minutes before they're supposed to leave and head our way. Um, Harry has to go to the hospital. He's got a big old splinter in his toe. Why does he have a big old splinter in his toe? Because he didn't listen to his mother. Well, that's what happens, right? And we're like, okay, so he's going to go to Children's Mercy, and here's the plan, you know, we're going to have, we end up with five of them, and then you have to explain to the five children why they have to wait for Christmas presents. Have you ever had to do that? 
They don't understand it, no matter how many words you've used. Harry's gone. He's going to feel bad if we have Christmas without him. We can't do that. That's just mean. Can't do it. Um, and we keep telling them, oh, he's going to be there soon, right? Uh, Jared ended up going out to spend the rest of the evening with him, and those two didn't get home until 1130 at night. And Harry remembers because the clock said 1128 when he got home. Very specific. And so our expectation did not match up with reality. We had to do it the next morning. And yes, it was wonderful. But sometimes it's just not quite the same wonderful that you're thinking it's going to be, that you're ready for. Our scripture reading today comes out of John chapter 4, and it starts at verse 4. Jesus had to go through Samaria. He came to a Samaritan city called Sakar, which was near the land of Jacob. And it was this is the land that he had given to his son Joseph. Jacob's well was there. Jesus was tired from his journey, so he sat down at the well, and it was about noon. It says Jesus had to go through the land of Samaria, but it wasn't necessarily a divine thing so much as A to B, this is the shortest distance. If anything, he shouldn't have gone that way just because of cultural standards going through Samaria. Jewish people and Samaritans didn't really get along. They weren't their kind of people, if that makes sense. And so a Samaritan woman came to the well to draw water. Jesus said to her, give me some water to drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy him some food. The Samaritan woman asked, Why do you, a Jewish man, ask for something to drink from me, a Samaritan woman? Jews and Samaritans didn't associate with each other. Okay, that last line leaves me wanting again, because they took the time to put in an extra note for you to let, them know, let you know they didn't get along, and then they don't tell you why. There's not enough information for me. First of all, why is the woman there at noon? Wouldn't you go in the morning? When everybody else is there and it's not hot in the middle of the day? What was she trying to avoid by going at this dis different time? Or did she have to go at the different time because she had such a big family she ran out of water? Was this her plan? Why? No idea. But the Jewish people and Samaritan people didn't get along. So they're adding it in to clarify. These two peoples would have shared what's called the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Bible. A lot of the same story, right? It's coming down. But they had one big disagreement. And the big disagreement was the main place of worship. Jewish people thought it was Jerusalem. And then the Samaritan people thought it was Mount Gerizim. And what the story doesn't tell you is that about 150 years before they're having this conversation, the Jewish people had destroyed the Samaritan's people place of worship. Can you see why they might not talk to each other? It would make them uncomfortable. And now here's Jesus... All she knows is a Jewish man asking her for water, and it's weird. Especially when you've been, you would have expected to be there alone. So then we pick up here in verse 10, and it says, Jesus responded, If you recognized God's gift and who is saying to you, give me some water to drink, you would be asking him, and he would give you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you don't have a bucket. And the well is deep. Where would you get this living water? You aren't greater than our father Jacob, are you? He gave this well to us, and he drank from it himself, as did his sons and his livestock. Now, Jesus is talking about eternal life, and we know this now, but that's not what the woman is thinking. She's not thinking eternal life. She's just thinking a spring or running water. So it makes complete sense to ask the man with no bucket how he's going to catch water. And then she starts to reference a story that they would both know. The story of Jacob. And she's trying to see if maybe he's talking about miracles. She's referring back to a miracle to see what his response is going to be. It's real progress from why are you talking to me? So we move on. We're in verse 13 now. Jesus answered, Everyone who drinks this water will be thirsty again. But whoever drinks from the water that I will give will never be thirsty again. The water that I give will become in those who drink it a spring of water that bubbles up into eternal life. 
The woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I will never be thirsty and will never need to come here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, get your husband and come back here. The woman replied, I don't have a husband. You are right to say, I don't have a husband, Jesus answered. You have, you've had five husbands, and the man you are with now isn't your husband. You've spoken the truth. A lot of people think that at this point, they're looking at the woman, and they're thinking that it, we're making some sort of moral judgment of the woman. Jesus asking about her husband. It's not really the point. Jesus asks for her husband because he needs access to the town, to the people, to deliver his message. And then he points out to her something she doesn't even say. He knows something about her life that he should not know. And it's big enough that she knows he didn't just hear it somewhere. She might have been stuck in the Levite law, where if one of your husbands dies, you have to marry the next one in line, etc., etc. That is a long path of tired if you lose five husbands in a row. If we think it's going to be some sort of moral judgment, we're missing the point. The point is that at that moment... He knows something about her he shouldn't know, and she sees in him, you are a prophet. You know these things, and this is so wonderful. So she asks him her burning theological question that she's ready to ask. If you sat down with a prophet, do you have that question that's at the top of your list that you'd probably ask him? This was her question. The woman said, sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain, but you and your people say it is necessary to worship in Jerusalem. In Jerusalem. Where's the right place to worship? She's not testing him because she doesn't know the answer. She's just genuinely hoping that he can give her the answer. That he can provide this information for her so she can worship properly. Jesus said to her, Believe me, woman. The time is coming when you and your people will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You and your people worship what you don't know. We worship what we know because salvation is from the Jews. But the time is coming and is here when true worshipers will worship in spirit and truth. The Father looks for those who worship him this way. God is spirit. And it is necessary to worship God in spirit and in truth. The woman said, I know that the Messiah is coming. The one who is called the Christ. When he comes, he will teach everything to us. Jesus said to her, I am the one who speaks with you. She knows the Christ is coming. And then he moves from being just a prophet to her into being the Christ as he confirms for her who he is. In that moment. And he tells her that this, your question, it doesn't matter. The hour is coming. The time is near when all of these present religious categories aren't going to matter. It doesn't make sense to put the labels on it. Just then, Jesus' disciples arrived and were shocked that he was talking with a woman. But no one asked, what do you want or why are you talking with her? The woman put down her water jar and went to the city. She said to the people, come and see a man who has told me everything I've done. Could this man be the Christ? They left the city and were on their way to see Jesus putting down her water bucket. This is the entire reason that she showed up in the first place. She needed water. She didn't even take it back with her. I get lost turning around in my own house, just grabbing things that go somewhere else and then travel into the next room because I found something there that I have to take to the other room. I get lost for 20 minutes doing that. This was her whole purpose that she showed up and she didn't even take it with her. 
she had something important to say. Something important to say. And when she said it, they started to believe. Many Samaritans in the city believed in Jesus because of the woman's word. When she testified, he told me everything I've ever done. So when the Samaritans came to Jesus, they asked him to stay with them. And he stayed there two days. Many more believed because of his word. And they said to the woman, We no longer believe because of what you said, for we have heard for ourselves and know that this one is truly the Savior of the world. Samaritans may have been a rival sect, but they also represented the Gentiles. They represented anybody who's not Jewish. And these people were coming to hear for themselves that salvation was not just for the Jews, but for everyone. And this woman's testimony convinced them to do it. And if we spent our time in this story worried about her moral standing, we might think to ourselves, oh, well, they're coming to Jesus because they don't believe her. No, no, they're coming to Jesus because they do. If you invite somebody to church, do you get upset when they show up? No, that's just silly. That's just silly. You're excited that they're here to hear and confirm for themselves. It's not a downplay of her testimony. It's a testament to it. That when she spoke, they listened. How exciting is that? And she gets to share with them this idea of this living water. And I spend a lot of time thinking about what this living water looks like. And we think about our lives and how we pour so much of ourselves into other people. I have a blended family, so I spend time pouring into my toddler, who takes a lot. He needs lots of things because he can't reach any of the cabinets. And then I pour into my little daughter who thinks she knows absolutely everything about everyone and wants to be the boss of it all. And then there's our little Ollie who's been in a Jedi costume since Christmas. And he loves every second of it. I tell you what. There's my oldest boy who is very into Pokemon, and I spend time learning about Pokemon, even though they're all made up words and made up characters, and I don't understand any of it. It's a fire type. Cool. I have no idea what it means. And then there's our little adventurer who always shows up with rocks and twigs and bugs, and you cannot take that into the house. And then there's our preteen who has a really hard time deciding between when to be a child and when to be an adult. And you're lost in that space in between. Then I come to people at work and I talk with them about their lives and what's going on and try to impart wisdom. Sometimes I don't have any. And then I listen to my husband chat normally about hunting. And then I call my mother on the phone, and she likes to talk to me, and we'll share a cup of coffee or something like that, right? I call, and I talk to my dad, normally brief conversations. He's not a super chatty fellow. But this is his mug. I stole it. Now lives at my house. And then your friend calls you up on the phone and says, do you have time? I need to talk. And you're looking at your day going, okay, but is it a coffee or a wine conversation? <laughs> it's a wine conversation. So you sit and you take time for the wine conversation. And I'm now realizing how much water I have for the wine conversation. That's okay. The toddler's going to interrupt it anyway. <laughs> but at some point, all of these fantastic people that I've spent pouring all of my time into all of my energy start to pour back into me. <coughs> my little toddler brings me something, or he gives me a kiss at night and says, I love you, Mama. I see you in the morning. Your daughter says, you look tired. Would you like a massage? It lasts 30 seconds, but it's wonderful. 
your little Jedi sets the table in his costume. Your little Pokemon lover lights up like a Christmas tree when you give him anything with Pokemon on it. He's so easy. Your little adventurer brings you something that he thinks you would like and not just to gross you out. Your preteen says, I'm going to be adult for a few minutes. I'll take the toddler. Okay. I love it. I get to go to work, and I get to hear all these wonderful stories of how God is working in the world and how we get to respond to it quickly. I get to go out on a date with my husband, and he listens to me chatter on about everything. I send 14 pictures of different fabrics to my mother and ask her which one would be the best for the chairs for my dining room table, and she actually answers me. I call my dad because I don't know how to use my own lawnmower because I hadn't mowed a lawn ever, and he drives out to show me how to use the lawnmower. Now I'm an expert. And then I call up my friend and I say, we need to talk, and she says, okay, is it a coffee or a wine conversation? And she comes and she listens to me. But no matter what, I can't make more water. I can pour into people that I know for a fact are going to pour back into me. But Christ calls us to pour into people without expecting anything in return. What happens to your water supply when you start pouring into people who aren't going to pour back into you? It goes down and down and down until eventually you're depleted. This is the moment where Christ comes in and says, I'm going to give you an unending supply so you don't have to worry about it. I'm going to give you living water. I'm going to give you so much water that it's not even going to fit in your pitcher. You're going to be trying to give it away so fast that you can't do it. It's not even possible. And we start to wonder, what does this look like? How is this represented for us? And that's when the magic happens. We realize it's something that we're already familiar with. It's in our place of worship. We offer it to everyone around us. And we say, this is not a St. Paul's table. This is not a Raymore table. This is Christ's table. Absolutely everyone is welcome to the table and welcome to this living water. Chris, this is the part where you come help me stir. I don't know if some of you noticed this in the scripture. But I skipped a part. <laughs> There's a part where the disciples come back before the people do, and they're talking to Jesus. In the meantime, the disciples spoke to Jesus, saying, Rabbi, eat. Jesus said to them, I have food to eat that you don't know about. The disciples asked each other, Has someone brought him food? Jesus said to them, I am fed by doing the will of the one who sent me and by completing his work. Don't you have a saying, four more months and then it's time for the harvest? Look, I tell you, open your eyes and notice that the fields are already ripe for the harvest. Those who harvest are receiving their pay and gathering fruit for eternal life so that those who sow and those who harvest can celebrate together. This is a true saying that one sows and another harvests. I have sent you to harvest what you didn't work hard for. Others worked hard, and you will share in their hard work. Food that you don't know about. Living water that can never run dry. On the night which he gave up himself up for us, he took the bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he said, Take, drink, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and juice. May they be for us the body and the blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ, redeemed by his blood. Because there is one loaf, we who are many are one body. And because we all partake of the one loaf, we all belong to the body of Christ. The cup over which we give thanks is a sharing of the blood of Christ. At this time, the table is set, and all are welcome to receive unending bread and living water. Will you please join us at the table? thing I need is to be heard, but to hear what you would say, the word of God speak, would you pour down like rain, washing my eyes to see your majesty to be still and know that you're in this place please let me stay and rest in your holiness the word of god speak
God speak Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness The word of God speak Would you pour down like rain Washing my eyes to see Your majesty To be still and know That you're in this place Please let me stay and rest In your holiness Word of God speak Finding myself at a loss for words, and the funny thing is, it's okay. pray with me. Gracious Heavenly Father, our pitcher overflows with the living water that you have granted us. May our, our gifts today, our tithes and our offerings be a representation of you in the world, an overflowing of our abundance. May we reach beyond the, even the scope of our understanding. We pray all these things in your name. Amen. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice, and trembles at his voice. How great is our Church. 
church, I invite you to stand and lift up name above your names. Name above. You are name above all names. Worthy. Worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Sing it again. You are name above all just our voices. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. As you go from this place today, may you go full of the bread of life and overflowing with the living water. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. How great is our God. Sing with me.